Hello. Good morning. Mm, wonderful to see you. Mm, so it is. So it is. Ah, uh, please excuse my fuzz buzz today. I cannot get rid of it. It's just some kind of weird light demon. I don't know. Bit weird. Um, who have we got today? Good morning, Clem and Gilly. Hey. Hello, Susanna. Hello, Yakuma Yasin. Welcome to our uh, economics uh, forum. Hey, Lee, good to see you. Hello again, Oliver. <laughs> Hello again. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, hopefully everyone's doing all right and we're ready for a big idea. Um, there are many big ideas. But this one, I, I, I can't quite believe I haven't done it before, but it's definitely a very big idea. Part of me thinks I must have done, but I can't find it if I have. So there you go. Mm. Uh, I'm getting old. I'm forgetting everything. Ooh. Um, yeah. Uh, where are we? We've got a nice new board to use today. So that'll be good. Hopefully that'll work and behave itself a bit better than the normal one. Um, and uh, we'll give everyone just a minute or two to connect up. Um, and then we'll jump in. Has anyone been up to anything fun this last week? Anyone got any exciting news? <laughs> the tumbleweed. The tumbleweed. <laughs> uh, oh, you're doing a ballet exam on Sunday. Oh, good luck with that. That's very cool. Ah, uh, oh, cool, Grace. You finished your GCSEs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And they're having a celebration. Hooray. <laughs> Hi, Chloe. Good morning, Brea. Good to see you. <laughs> hello, hello. Um, yeah. Uh, with sweets, a sweet-based celebration. Hooray. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, oh, Kit, stage two sailing. Well done. That's very cool. So we've got ballet dancers, sailors, and uh, uh, lots of people eating sweets. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I like that, I like that. <laughs> um, you can do bull whip. What is bull whip? Like whipping a bull with, with a whip? Is that a thing? <laughs> um, I don't know what a bull whip is. Well, I know, I know what a bull whip is. I don't know what, what the, the verb to bull whip is. That's what I'm struggling with, I guess. Uh, so, uh, yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, if I haven't said hello to you already, good morning. And uh, today we have a big idea. And, uh, yeah, let's bring it up. Ooh, money! Oh, yeah. We love it. We hate it. It kind of makes the world go round in some ways. Um, it's a big, big, big idea. And it really is, you know, money on a sort of, well, especially in, in modern times, money is getting quite philosophical, guys. Um, it's not as straight cut as maybe it once was, or maybe it never was straight cut. I don't know. The whole concept behind money is kind of interesting. Hmm. Um, oh, that sounds cool, Brea. Whip cracking. Whip crack away, whip crack away, whip crack away. Oh, that does sound fun. Cool. <laughs> you can crack a rose off your head with a whip that's pretty impressive i'd like to see that <laughs> is that a real song yeah that's from what one's that from calamity jane there's a good old musical i'm just gonna get on with this now because it's embarrassing so money <laughs> um, we're gonna look today at commodity money to start with we're gonna think about the connection between rarity and value um, both words kind of hard to define especially value we're going to that's going to take us into the gold standard and then we're going to bring it up more to date with the fiat idea of money. Um, we're going to have a look at the cycle of boom and bust, uh, which is something which our man Adam Smith uh, understood very well um, and is an interesting uh, philosophy all of its own, really. 
And then we're going to end up with living the dream. Oh, yeah. Now, I've got as our little character today, we're going for Mr. Money, Mr. Monopoly, because he kind of represents, I suppose, capitalism and money uh, in, in, a, in a way. So, yeah, we love him and we hate him, don't we? It's like the game Monopoly. It's kind of fun, but it's also highly frustrating and, uh, you know, can lead to quite high tensions. Um, my sister, I believe, still has a scar from playing Monopoly. Not from myself, of course, but, you know, it just, just proves that Monopoly can be quite a dangerous game, for sure. Um, so let's jump into the concept of what commodity money is and we'll, yeah, we'll take it from there. So first up, uh, commodity money is a way of saying, you know, we have a thing and that thing in itself has value, yeah? So the most obvious is gold, all right? Gold is valuable because you can do loads of stuff with it. <laughs> yeah, no, you're quite right. Brea says that, uh, and, and she's quite right, that Monopoly was created by a communist who she, she really hated the capitalist system and she wanted to teach people how bad it was. And then essentially the game was stolen off her and then used to sort of show the greatness of capitalism, which is, is you know, is a terrible, terrible thing. But hey, yo, um, it used to be that uh, money was based on what people found valuable. Yeah. So some of the earlier forms of money that we have, or at least one of the earliest, is cowrie shells. Uh, the, this was the currency in China, you know, like 3000 years ago, um, because people in mainland China, they didn't have much access to these little shells. And so they had a value all of themselves for making into jewelry or, you know, other sort of nice sort of beautiful items. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was quite good. You know, it worked quite well. Not many people live near the sea, so it's not as if everyone can just grab cowrie shells. And so they became the currency of like the early dynasties of China. Um, yeah, they had a value to themselves. That's kind of the idea, you know. Before we have money at all, we have trade, we have barter. So, you know, I've got a chicken, you've got a piglet, let's swap, you know, you want eggs, I want pork, yeah, let's do it. Um, you know, it kind of made sense. Everything was based on the value that the people in the society gave to it. So, you know, things that were useful had a value, whereas things that weren't so useful did not have much value. Now, that does lead us to some strange places. Uh, one of the Polynesian islands decided that they would make money out of stones. They would just get little stones and they put holes in it. You know, yeah, this is like a bit less than commodity money at this point. Yeah, let's let's just say, you know, everyone needs stone. So we get these stones, we put a hole in it to show that it's just not a normal stone. We show that it's money. And, you know, the more of these stones you have or the bigger these stones that you have, the richer you are. But that led to some very strange behavior on the island as people just started finding bigger and bigger rocks and boring huge holes through them. Now, Jack and the Beanstalk with the cow. That's it. That looks like a bad trade, doesn't it? At first, it's like you're swapping a cow, which is something with real actual value for a handful of beans, which is something that doesn't have a necessary value. Yeah. Unless, of course, you know, we believe the story and it turns out that actually those beans are magic and therefore they do have you know, a value as a commodity. Um, on this Polynesian island, things got out of hand. People kept finding bigger and bigger stones, boring bigger and bigger holes in them until you got to a point where the currency was essentially useless because no one could actually move it around. You can't carry that rock in your pocket. You know, if you want to buy a loaf of bread, you can't just sort of roll this humongous rock up a hill to give it to the uh, milk supplier. So it kind of didn't work, which shows that, you know, maybe commodity money is the way to go. You know, we trade commodities nowadays. You know, there are some very valuable things on earth, like oil is particularly valuable, as we're finding out right now. Um, food will always have its own intrinsic value. Uh, materials to make clothing will always have an intrinsic value. So why not just, you know, trade things? Um, beans are alien children. What? <laughs> okay, Brea has a theory that Pythagoras wouldn't eat beans because they're alien children, because he went to the pyramid cult and learned that beans were aliens. It could be. I mean, th there are many great points that you make there, Brea. Also, maybe not. But I, 
I'm not saying you're wrong. I would never dare say such a thing. Um, you know, all these theor theories are, you know, potentially true. <laughs> um, so in simplest terms, money, you know, we use a commodity and we trade it with each other. That works if the money in value or the commodity in value in, in question has a value to it. Yeah. Um, nobody wants, I don't know, what would be a useless commodity to trade? Um, spiders, you know, spiders would not be a great commodity. Not many people want spiders. Plastic bags, yeah, that's a good other one, you know. There is a, a basic use to a spider and there is a basic use to a plastic bag, but it's not really one that people want uh, to trade for, usually. Cardboard, yeah, that's that would be a lame one. Yeah, that's a good one, Clem and Gilly. Uh, Chloe wants spiders. Well, maybe that's a bad example. Um, the problem with some commodities, though, is that they're quite perishable. So milk is, you know, it's a useful commodity. People want milk, you know, people make a lot of use of it. But you can't keep it around. You can't store it for long, you know. So what do we do? We, we make the cow the commodity, perhaps. But that's difficult. What if we live in a modern society where the average person, you know, just doesn't have room to keep cows? Yeah, I couldn't keep a cow in my house. Well, I could maybe kill keep one. But... You know, that would be the extent of my possible wealth because, well, I can only fit one cow. Um, I could milk it every day and make money from the milk, but I've got to make sure that I'm doing it literally every day because, well, it's going to go off after a couple of days and then I'm stuck. You know, same with meat and things, uh, any, any perishable food or, or commodities. That's really difficult to turn into a currency. So currency starts off as either, you know, things that we need that we're bartering and trading for each other, or they start off as kind of, you know, interesting little rarities that do have a use, but maybe the use as money is you know, just as good. So we then get the idea that rarity has value. Yeah. How about instead of, you know, the commodity itself being important, like, you know, everyone's going to find wheat and milk and, I don't know, wood useful and important. Um, oh, thanks. Clem and Gilly will look after my cow for me. That's nice of you. <laughs> I, I will, uh, if I ever do get a cow, I'll remember that. Thank you. Um, diamonds. Yeah, diamonds are a great example of how sometimes just being rare is the value, yeah? Now that word value is a really hard one to unpick, isn't it? You know, what has value? And trying to, you know, we, we kind of know intrinsically what value is, you know, you will probably have an idea of what's very valuable, and me too. Uh, but those may not jive, you know? And depending on the situation we're in, things have different value, like, if I'm living in today's society, then having a diamond is very valuable, like really valuable. Um, I can trade it, I can sell it, I can make it into very expensive jewellery. Yeah, they, they do have an intrinsic value too, that's true. Kevin Gillian pointing out that they're very light and very strong. So diamonds are used in industry a lot, you know, for cutting devices and drills and all kinds of things. So there is an intrinsic value in diamonds. And, you know, I would find it very useful if I had a diamond right now, I would see that as, as being incredibly valuable. But it makes me think of King Solomon's Mines, yeah? I don't know if you've ever read King Solomon's Mines, but it's a story of an explorer, and he goes out, what's his name, Alan Quatermain. He goes to South Africa, and there he is. He's tracking down this diamond mine that he wants to get hold of to you know, make himself rich, and he ends up being locked in the diamond mine. And... Uh, as the sort of evil witch character, as she locks him up in the diamond mine, she says, ha, you have the diamonds, eat of them, drink of them. And of course he can't, you know, he's surrounded by diamonds, but he's locked in this big, big diamond mine. It's no use to him, no value at all. What he needs is food and water. Yeah, that now has the, the you know, maximum value and the diamonds are less than useless. They're just kind of shiny reminders that he's gonna die. Okay. He gets away because it's an adventure story. But the point being, value can change very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, right now, oil is incredibly valuable. Yeah. Everyone needs oil. We need it for our machinery. We need it for electricity generation. We need it to power our cars and other vehicles. But we can definitely conceive of a time in the future 
when we have electric cars and I don't know, sustainable power generation where people will look at oil and they'll just go, what? That's not, who wants that? That's gross. That's yucky. It's polluting. Blah. And so oil will lose its value. Much like, you know, before you know, the turn of the last century, oil didn't have a value. It was just kind of gross stuff that they found in the ground. You know, a few people used it. The ancient Egyptians poked around with it a bit, but no one actually did anything with it. It wasn't valuable. It was more like a, a hindrance having this disgusting stuff sort of oozing out of the ground at, you know, in different weird, weird places. You can't drink it. That's right. You know, it doesn't help. Right now it's valuable, but it didn't used to be. And it, I imagine it won't be in the future. It will just be, you know, something yucky. So the value of something is relative to the people that are using it or consuming it or wanting it. Yeah. And value can change. One thing that does seem to make sense, though, is that rarity is important. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, that's true. Now, that Brayer says that, you know, the oil won't exist if we use it all. And of course, the more we use, the rarer it gets. And that means the price of it will go up. At the moment, oil isn't crazily priced. I mean, it's valuable, but it's not crazy because you know, we still have years and years and years and years and years worth of it if we want to keep using it. Uh, same with coal. Coal is relatively cheap. But as that gets rarer, it may well become more expensive because it's not renewable. You know, it, we can't uh, create more coal. It just doesn't happen. Now, someone who understood that rarity and value are intrinsically linked was this guy here, Cecil Rhodes. Wow, Cecil. I mean, possibly the character in history that I dislike the most. I don't know. There's a, there's a short list, and he's definitely on it, um, mainly for his philosophy, to be honest. His philosophy was incredibly racist, like just just ah, next level racism. But anyway, Cecil Rhodes, he was an enterprising young man from England. Um, <laughs> he can't be bothered with a beard. He has a good moustache, though. It's true. He's a fine looking fellow, if you disregard his heart of evil. Um, but anyway, Rhodes, he was you know, a very successful man. You know, by most of our modern standards, especially if we're talking about money, he was incredibly successful. He was a millionaire in the 1880s, in his 20s, you know, very young man, um, managed to become a millionaire, which in the 1820s, that's like, you know, being a multimillionaire today. But for sure, he was incredibly successful in business. Um, unfortunately, he made that money through uh, exploiting uh, the mainly uh, black people of South America, but also the uh, you know, the Boer people of South, uh, South Africa too. But the thing is, he set up a company. He was quite a clever guy, not a nice guy, but a very clever guy. And he set up this mining company called De Beers. Today, they are the biggest miners and traders of diamonds in the world. You know, De Beers is still a company. He's long dead. He died in like, I don't know, the 1920s or something. Um, but... He understood very well that it's rarity that makes something valuable. And that left him with a bit of a problem. He's got all these diamond mines that he's like stolen. Yeah. Uh, he had a country named after him, Rhodesia. Um, but he had all these diamond mines. And diamonds are incredibly valuable. But why are diamonds incredibly valuable? Well, because they're quite rare. So he realized that if he's too successful, he's actually going to sort of shoot himself in the foot. If his diamond mines are constantly producing diamonds, then the more he sells, the less rare they are and the less money he's going to make. Therefore, the less point there is in digging them out of the ground. But he came up with a plan, a plan that is still in action today. Um, if you go to the De Beers diamond warehouse, there's something like, I don't know, three billion dollars worth of diamonds that they keep in a great big warehouse. They are not for sale. They will never, you know, they won't be for sale because they realize that if they put them up for sale, then the price of diamonds will drop. So what De Beers does is they keep mining diamonds, keep mining diamonds, but they intentionally keep them secret. Yeah, they hide them away. They don't let anyone get to them. You know, until very recently, they pretended they didn't exist, you know, for the first like, I don't know, nearly 100 years of their operation. They just pretended they didn't have any diamonds. 
but they are. They're just sat there in a huge warehouse with uh, Brea says, let's rob it. You could rob it, but I think it's pretty well protected and also in a secret location. But the point being, he realized that you can create your own rarity. Yeah. He could keep his diamond mines going, you know, pulling diamonds out the ground, you know, cutting them and all that kind of stuff, making jewelry. But the secret is not to make, not to let people know you've got enough of it. You've got to keep them secret. Nowadays, of course, diamonds are a bit, well, almost a little bit ridiculous. We can make diamonds. And I, I said, well, not me. I can't personally make a diamond. But human beings can make artificial diamonds, which are pretty much exactly the same as the ones that we find in the ground. You know, they're chemically, they are identical. Um, they have all the same properties. They look the same. But if you go on the market and you buy a man-made diamond, it will cost you a lot less than an like a should we call it a natural diamond that you find in the ground but there's no reason yeah on term on levels of a commodity one you know a man-made diamond is exactly the same as a naturally occurring diamond there's no difference at all you know you wouldn't be able to tell the difference but people still pay more for the natural diamonds because they think it has some kind of intrinsic value that's higher but it doesn't it's kind of weird People are strange like this. Um, Brea, you pointed out earlier that you could find diamonds under the sea. You know, there's no shortage of diamonds on this planet. Some of them are harder to get to than others. You know, we could go under the ocean and we could start diamond farming if we had the right technology. Um, and that, of course, would drive the price of diamonds down. So people like De Beers, the people who run De Beers today, they make sure that people are not <laughs> going out and making too many diamonds or finding them on the ocean because that would ruin their business model. Hmm. It doesn't sound too serious to me. You know, it's a bit sneaky pretending that there's not any diamonds and then selling your diamonds for a load of money. Um, but it's not necessarily dangerous or a bad thing. I mean, it's it's maybe slightly unfair and dishonest. But what if that rare item was really valuable? What if it did have a higher intrinsic value? What if somebody did this with, I don't know, grain or water or I don't know, medicine, some kind of like if somebody had the cure for cancer and they kept it artificially rare so that the value was higher and people had to pay more for it. I mean, would that cross a line between just being, you know, sneaky and greedy into being evil? I don't know. Mm, not sure how that should work. But what we do know is that rarity and value are attached together. And probably the greatest example of this throughout history, Chloe reckons that would be evil. I guess it would be. Yeah. I mean, diamonds, no one really needs a diamond, do they? We like diamonds. Diamonds are great. You don't need a diamond necklace or a diamond ring or diamond earrings, as we see here. But yeah, if it became something that we really did need, that could be an issue. And we kind of do see that, don't we? Some of the richest companies in the world are the pharmaceutical companies who sell their cures for you know, whatever diseases they can cure, and they make sure that they don't, you know, make it too cheap. They want to make a lot of money. Hmm. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, Brea says that diamonds are often used to show how much you value another person. So if I love you very much, I will get you a diamond. What's that phrase? Diamond are a girl's best friend? I'm not sure if that's true. Um, you know, my wife, she has a best friend who's not a diamond. But anyway, that's irrelevant. Um, but you're quite right. Maybe if we, as a society, if we put value onto something, which we have with diamonds, you know, if, if you know, the best kind of wedding ring that you could wear would be a diamond ring, wouldn't it? You know, it just is. Um, yeah, even though other, yeah, even though other stones may look prettier, you know, jade, in my opinion, is prettier than a diamond. Um, tiger eyes, yeah, they're very pretty too, but they're not anywhere near as worth, uh, you know, uh, uh, worth as much money. Sapphires, yeah, they're beautiful, aren't they? But yeah, our society seems to attach this sort of mystical, magical value to a diamond that you know, other stones that are pretty or perhaps don't have. It's just kind of the way we do. Now, the clearest example and the way that our money worked for many, many centuries was by using a gold standard of some kind. It's not, you know, we often talk about the gold standard. It's kind of difficult to talk about the gold standard because actually there were lots of different gold standards. Um, yeah, that's a good point, Loki. Um, queer, uh, queer, uh, clear quartz 
pa, 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 looks the same as diamond. Yeah, I mean, if I, you could get cut glass and it would look very, very similar. Um, but of course, we just don't give it any value at all because anyone can cut glass to look like diamond and clear quartz is pretty, you know, cheap. It is no, clear quartz isn't really, as far as I know, any rarer than diamond, you know, but we don't give it the same value. So it doesn't get that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you would make a flying machine out of diamonds. That sounds quite nice. Yeah. That would be a boss move. <laughs> Yeah, the coin here is pretty pretty, isn't it? Yeah. So the gold standard is is how sort of economics really started in the way that we think of it now. Um, at some point, you know, and I think, again, in China are the first responsible for this. Uh, in China, they started making paper money. Yeah. They had these bits of paper that said, you know, this bit of paper is worth X amount of gold. Hmm. Sounds kind of good. Um, the Lydians in the ancient world, about 500 uh, BC, they created was it, like uh, metal money for the first time on Earth. They took their gold, which they liked, and silver, which they thought was a really cool metal. They turned them into little discs, and you know they they were figured out that you could imprint images on them to make political messages, even like we do today. And yeah, they started trading them. It's like, we like gold, gold is useful. So let's trade it, let's swap it around. Hmm. Um, like in The Witches when she prints out money. Yeah, we'll get to sort of printing out money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true, Brer. Yes, Terry Pratchett made the golem standard. <laughs> um, but the idea behind both metal money and original paper money was the same thing. Uh, it represents a real commodity or is the real commodity. So in the case of a gold coin, it is gold. Yeah. So we're just taking gold, which is the thing we've all decided is going to be valuable. And we're swapping it. You know, I give you gold for chicken. I give you gold for piglet, whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, I give you gold for more gold. Mm, that's a bad deal. I'm not accepting that. Um, the paper money, it represented gold that was stored somewhere. So here we have the famous Fort Knox in America. Um, home to you know what used to be millions and millions of dollars worth of gold bars and you know gold at, it, it became kind of difficult to carry around yeah you gotta gold's heavy it's kind of awkward you know it, it's all right for small everyday purchases if you're gonna like, buy things that are worth like a tiny fraction of gold you can have your thin little gold coins but if you want to do big transactions if you want to buy a house or something you can't be carrying around you know, three tons of gold bullion or however much it would be. That'd be an impressive house, by the way. Um, so instead, we came up with systems where you would put the gold in a storeroom, a bank, we'll call it. The gold lives there. It doesn't move. It just stays there, all locked away, nice and safe. And then we make bits of paper. And those bits of paper say, you know, I will present to the bearer the value of 10 pounds of gold or whatever it is. And that way, we can make trading much easier and smoother because we can carry around bits of paper rather than bits of gold. But those bits of paper, they still represent something solid. Yeah. In theory, you know, before, what was it, the 1970s? You know, let's say you know, it's the year 1920. I've got 10 pounds. I've got a 10 pound note. I could go to my bank and say, hey, I've got this 10 pound note. Give me 10 pounds worth of gold, please. And they would because that's what the get to the 10 pound note does. It represents that piece of gold that's in the bank. Hmm. <laughs> it's nice to get a penny at the bank. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's how banking originally started. Yeah, we have bits of paper. We've got this money. We've gone away from having something with its own intrinsic value. Yeah, a bit of paper isn't actually worth much, is it? Um, you no, know, it's paper. Everyone's got paper. Paper doesn't cost you anything. 10 pounds, you know, a 10 pound note is just a tiny bit of paper. And if I wanted to buy that much paper, I wouldn't, it wouldn't cost me 10 pounds. It would cost me something like 0 0.0001 pence or something to buy that much paper. So it doesn't really have any value there. Can you make gold artificially? No, I don't think so yet. Gold was all, all came out of a supernova. Um, so only, you need the heat of a supernova to create gold. Um, you know, billions of years ago, a supernova went off, or multiple ones did, and gold just rains down on this planet from space. So all gold comes from space, which makes it way more special. It's like 
ooh, supernova space rain. That's that, that that you know it does have this kind of quality that is kind of almost spiritually like interesting. I don't know. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think you can make gold yet because we can't get to those kind of temperatures. Um, but diamonds we can do because all you need with diamonds is like to compress uh, things and heat them relatively low. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll just have to get another supernova to rain gold on our planet. Ah, Loki says that all iron came from space too. That's cool. That's awesome. <laughs> a lot of the diamonds came from space too, although diamonds can also be formed uh, in like volcanic areas. So yeah, diamonds are, are easier to make than gold, basically, I think is the, is the, is the lowdown there. Um, so yeah, we, we move away from having currency that is itself the value yeah so a gold coin we've got this aztec gold coin over here which you know is in itself it you know useful or valuable because it is made of the material we want and we start making you know paper but it's still linked to that yeah it's linked to the gold that is somewhere you know it represents uh, something that is real mm. um oh here we go uh Oh, okay. So Kit says you can make gold, but the easiest metal to convert into gold is platinum, which is more expensive than gold. <laughs> That's quite cool. So there you go. I didn't know that. Thanks, Kit. <laughs> so that would be utterly pointless, wouldn't it? You'd have to get a more expensive material. You'd have to, uh, I don't know, use a lot of energy, which would be expensive, and you'd end up with something less valuable than the platinum you started with. That's cool. There we go. Um, space glitter <laughs> is, is valuable. <laughs> I didn't know that kit. Thanks. That's good. Um, can you turn gold into platinum? That would be the thing to do, wouldn't it? That's what we want to do. We want to be able to turn one <laughs> a less uh, valuable substance into the more valuable substance. That's the trick. Very difficult to do, though. Hmm. Um, and alchemy has been a big thing for you know thousands of years. People trying to turn lead into gold is the famous one. Um, Oh, that's cool. Look, he says the Spanish thought that platinum was unripe gold. <laughs> that's good. That's very cool. <laughs> uh, hey, what is this? Uh, this uh, gold is uh, not ripe yet. Hmm. Yeah, that would make sense. Um, now, talking about the Spanish, that's why we have the Aztec gold here. Um, having a gold standard is great as long as everyone agrees what the value of gold is. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the idea that I don't know, one kilogram of gold is worth, I don't know, 5,000 pounds or, or whatever it is. I don't know what the actual value of gold is today. Um, that works. If everyone in your economy agrees that gold is worth the same amount, yeah, it gets difficult, and it did get difficult in history, when different countries have their own gold standards. So if I've got gold in my bank in China, or I've got gold in my bank in Britain, and I want to trade between the two, that can get difficult. What if you know the Chinese gold is not worth as much as the English gold or vice versa? Then that makes international trade difficult. So we had to kind of come up with some kind of system where large group areas of the planet had the same gold standards. You know, gold is worth this much, silver is worth that much, uh, platinum is worth this much. And then once you've got parity between all those things, then you know, that's going to going, going to work out okay in theory. Hmm. But what if suddenly our concept that rarity is value smashes into our concept that, you know, we like we have a certain value on gold? And that's happened a few times in history. Uh, one of the most obvious is when Spain conquered or at least discovered and then gave a really good kicking to the new world, the Americas. They came back having defeated you know, m massive civilizations like the Aztecs and the Mayans with just tons of the stuff. And it turned out that that really did mess up the Spanish economy. The Spaniards, they had so much gold that everyone started saying, oh, OK, this is gold. It's boring. Who wants gold anymore? Everyone's got gold. You know, my granny's walking around with gold teeth and a gold ring. And, you know, she just, she's just a cabbage farmer from Madrid. I mean, who cares? It's not, imp it's not impressive anymore, guys. It's not rare. And so the Spanish economy... Uh, really did take a big whack as you know the value of their most impressive commodity started to erode. Uh, Some time before that, we had this in uh, Mali in Western Africa. Uh, Mansa Musa, the great Malian king, he had so much gold from the gold mines of Africa. Uh, he went to Mecca. 
he gave gold to just everyone he saw as a sort of charity thing. He was a Muslim, just giving loads of, of gold away. And he gave up, gave away so much gold in Egypt that he crashed the Egyptian economy because they just, you know, gold lost its value because rarity equals value. And as soon as it's not rare anymore, because Mansa Musa has just dumped, you know, 15 tons of gold in your country, then that messes up the whole system. So the gold system standard is good or any kind of standard that's based on a real valuable metal or, or commodity, but it's not perfect. You know, it can lead to problems if that thing stops being rare. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, Brea says there's uh, a Spanish person who said he'd let an Inca king live if he filled a room with gold, and the king did fill the room with gold because it's just gold. And yeah, that you know, the 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 uh, Central Native Americans, people like the, the Incans who are more South American, I guess, the Aztecs and the Mayans, they valued gold because it was pretty and they could, you know, it's it's very soft, so you can make beautiful decorations out of it, brilliant for jewelry and you know pretty coins and stuff or even cups and plates and things but they saw no monetary value in it it was just kind of you know because they had loads of it it's like well yeah what's the point they probably saw more value in things like pretty bird feathers and uh obsidian which is a really valuable uh rock because you can you know use it as weapons and stuff it has more intrinsic value to them than the gold did whereas the spanish all they wanted was the gold and the Native Americans didn't really understand. It's like, well, why? What, what, you know, are you doing something with this that we don't get? Are you making something more impressive? No, we're just turning it into coins and saying that it's worth, you know, this amount of, you know, theoretical philosophical money. Hmm. So then we come to the fiat money, uh, with which paper money is sort of a fiat currency, but at least, you know, back in the day, it was linked to something real. Fiat currency or fiat money is where it's not linked to anything anymore, yeah? So our modern money, we've gone away from the gold standard. You know, if you have a 10 pound note, you cannot go to the local bank and say, give me 10 pounds of gold. They just won't have it. Um, Fort Knox, I think still has gold in it probably, but it's not used in the same way. Instead, we have money that is dictated by our governments essentially. The government decides how much money we should have and how much it should value it should have. Now, it's not like a clear cut decision because the government don't actually have much control over it. Once you let a fiat currency go, it kind of takes on a life of its own. But money today is just a lot of numbers on computers. It's kind of like the matrix. You know, my bank will tell me that I've got X amount of money in my bank account. OK, maybe I've got, you know, I've got 10 pounds in my bank. Brilliant. You know, where is that 10 pounds? It's certainly not in a safe somewhere. It really is just on the internet, yeah? It's in the banking system. Money sloshes around, but it's just lots and lots of numbers on lots and lots of spreadsheets, on lots and lots of computers that people, well, it only works because everyone agrees that it should work. That's the secret. Um, if everyone agrees that the money in our bank is worthwhile, has a worth, then it does. But it would be very easy for everyone to just say, eh, no, actually, I think the most valuable thing should be acorns now. If everyone decided that the most valuable thing should be acorns, then, well, we'd all go out and start shaking oak trees. Um, yeah, you are. Brea has lots of acorns. Awesome. Um, you would be the richest Brea in the world. Um, and whereas the people who you know, can't get to the oak trees or maybe are too small and weak to climb the oak tree to pick the acorns, they would be the poorest people in the world. Oh. But the point is, it comes down to what we want to believe on a philosophical level. Oh, there you are. See, Chloe's got an oak tree in the garden. You'd be sorted. You'd be really rich. <laughs> Whereas I don't have an oak tree in my garden, so I would be poor. Um, and in some ways, it's no more ridiculous than the system we've got now. It's, you know, we believe in a thing as a society. And in fact, it goes even further. Now we believe in a thing as a planet. You know, every human on Earth agrees that well pretty much every human maybe there's a few that don't but most humans on earth agree with them with the financial system that we have yeah we trade imaginary money with other countries for their imaginary money you know and that system seems to work quite well we can do clever things where we can trade on the potential future of money which is really confusing you know i can 
essentially make bets as to what my money will be worth in five years time and trade with the, that idea in mind. Um, you know, some of it's linked to commodity, but a lot of it isn't. Yeah, you'd have to be paid in acorns. That's true. Yeah. Maybe the squirrels would become the bankers of the world. Hmm. It's a terrible dystopia I've crunched up in my head now. Um, uh, <laughs> that's good. Brea says, uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, they decide that leaves are money, but it caused so much inflation, they burnt all the trees to make leaves rarer. Yeah, it's that's the De Beers thing, isn't it? That's Cecil Rhodes. Ah, we've got all these diamonds. Everyone's agreed that diamonds are valuable. What do we do? We can't have too many diamonds or they'll lose their value. Hide them, hide them, bury them in the ground like the acorns of a giant squirrel, uh, which is essentially what the De Beers company is doing today. Because, well, you know, can't have too much of a good thing or it's not a good thing anymore. Hmm. So we now live in this really weird world where everyone's agreed on what is essentially a myth. Yeah, it's it's a story that we tell ourselves. The numbers in my bank account are worth something on some kind of level that has no relation to anything physical at all anymore. Um, it really is just numbers. And those numbers, though, they kind of work because it's not just belief that we have in them. It's trust. Yeah. I trust that my ten pounds, you know, whether it's on my credit card or my bank card or if it's in my pocket in the form of coins or paper, I trust that everyone around me understands the value of that in the same way that I do. You know, we trust each other. And that's kind of amazing that we can have as a human race. We can have this layer of trust that goes all the way around the world. You know, I could go to China and I can swipe my bank card and I can buy, you know, an acorn if I want to. I don't know if, they, if they're big on acorns in China, selling acorns. Maybe it's a golden acorn. I could buy it with my card. It would work because... I agree with all the Chinese people that money is a thing, yeah, that you know, the governments of the world have sorted this thing out. Hmm. Um, <laughs> no, Brea, now maybe uh, Brea suggests that maybe it's not trust, maybe it's ignorance or not thinking about it. Maybe that, maybe you're right. You know, how many people actually think about what money is? Maybe not many people at all. You know, we're all just born into a world where money is a thing and it works like this and we all just got to get on with it. I mean, this is quite pertinent at the moment, more so than when I decided to do a lesson on money. Um, we're seeing the cost of living rising. Yeah. The cost of you know, getting fuel and buying food or clothes is all. There you are. <laughs> there you go, Chloe. Yeah. yeah. But all that, that, that stuff is rising. All the cost of it's rising. But hang on. The, the like, value of those commodities isn't. I need milk just as much as I did you know, three months ago when milk was cheaper. So, but I don't need any more now. It's not like I've come up with some kind of new use for milk that I need more milk. You know, milk is milk, bread is bread. Um, petrol, you know, I still need to drive my car as much now as I did six months ago when the petrol was cheaper. So why is it more expensive now? Well, it's more expensive now because, well, the systems, the economic systems have decided. <laughs> no, people don't need milk. That's true. Um, but, you know, we need food in general, groceries in general. There's no actual reason why those groceries are more expensive now than they were six months ago it's all to do with the fact that you know the system that we've agreed on this system of you know imaginary money that's set in some way by governments and regulated by banking institutions um because it's certainly not that the government have control of it the government you know they have certain levers that they can pull they can make more money you know, called quantitative easing. They can just print more. You know, hey, people haven't got enough money. Let's print more money. We'll give it to them. But if they do that, then everyone's got more money and the value of things start to go a bit skew iffy. We get inflation. So it's this balance that the governments and the banks are always trying to do. They're trying to say, hey, okay, well, we want more money, but we don't want too much money because if we have too much money, then, well, it, it doesn't become rare enough. And then people are, you know, just charge more for the goods that they have and we end up with inflation and then people aren't earning enough money at work in order to pay for that new price because of inflation. And what do we do? What do we do? And that's what the government is now scrambling to try and figure out. You know, do we give people more money? I mean, that's one strategy they come up with. They'll just give every family in the country 400 pounds to buy energy with. That's cool, you know. But suddenly, I mean, does that solve a problem? Not if the if the energy is going to rise by more than 400 pounds, it doesn't. Um, 
you know, do we just stop using the commodities? Well, stop using petrol, guys. But then if we stop using petrol, then the petrol economy will go down and, oh dear, that's a problem too. But this is a problem that has been baked into the system, essentially, for a very long time. Adam Smith understood this uh, when he sort of started becoming the father of economics. The system that we have that runs off the money we have now, we get this thing called a business cycle, which sounds very sort of innocuous. Ah, oh, a business cycle. Sounds quite nice. Um, but essentially, in a capitalist society that uses a fiat currency like our own, we are always going to get this trend. Yeah, Our axis down the bottom here is periods of time. This could be decades. It could be years. It could be centuries. It's never centuries. It's usually like decades. Um, but as the decades go by, we go through a very common uh, pattern. So at first, people start getting more and more wealthy. Yeah, we start earning more money. We get jobs. Uh, we uh, you know, start buying stuff in greater amounts, greater and greater. The more money we have, the more stuff we can buy. Um, the more uh, well that businesses are doing, the cheaper they can afford to sell their products, and the more stuff that people can buy. I mean, it's great. We go through these wonderful times that we call expansion or maybe recovery, as you'll see in a minute. These expansive times are the good times. It's the times when people can you know, go out and buy loads of stuff and really enjoy it. Food is cheap and everyone's got loads of it. It's great. Um, we saw this, a period like this, in the 1920s, you know, in America in particular, but all over the place. We saw how just people were making money hand over fist. The stock market was doing well. Everyone agreed that money is valuable and these things that we're going to buy with it have value too. It was great, the booming 20s. But this always le reaches a peak, a peak when suddenly every, you know, the amount of money that we're spending and the amount of you know, money we're earning, it just can't go any higher because, well, we can't, you know, we're not, we can't just print more money. Eventually, we've got to get to the peak time where you know, everyone's maxed out. Now, because of a whole range of factors, maybe the government overdoes it a little bit, you know, gives out too much money, more than it should. Maybe because people are being reckless. People stop saving money. And instead, they're just, you know, buying things that maybe have, you know, less intrinsic value. But a whole load of things come together. Maybe people are gambling too much on the stock markets and the money goes down. We go from a boom time where money is being made hand over fist to a bust time when everyone starts losing that money. Things grow in value, uh, monetary value. Yeah, so the same products that we used to be buying for one penny are now costing 10 pennies. People can't keep up. Wages are not increasing at the same rate as inflation. People start losing their jobs, which means they can't buy so much stuff, which means that companies that sell stuff, especially stuff that's luxury stuff that maybe not everyone needs, they start closing down because, well, there's no point making, I don't know, fancy balaclavas if nobody can afford to buy a fancy balaclava anymore. Hmm, that's a weird example, but you get my point. We call this the bust. Yeah, it gets bad. People start getting poor. Um, societies start to you know, really get into trouble. And then we hit something called the trough, which is the opposite of the peak. That's the time when the, you know, the financial problems are at their highest. You know, poverty, uh, joblessness, unemployment, they are at their worst. But then things start to get better. You know, people pull financial levers. Um, new businesses are formed to come up with new ways to deal with money. Maybe new government regulations are put in. And people start to grow. Their economies start to get better. Money starts to have more value again. Uh, and, you know... It's as if this has never happened before. People go crazy. They're like, hey, let's buy all the stuff. Let's have fun. Let's gamble on the stock market. And eventually, all of that unbridled greed and avarice will lead to the next crash. And we see this over and over again. It's not a new thing. And like I say, it was baked into the system when it was created. It's part of the system. It's not like a, a, a bug in the system. It's how it should work. Um, it's just not very nice when you're going down into the trough. Now, the last trough that we had, the last sort of bust that we had was in 2008, 2009, when in America particularly, but all over the world, really, um, people have been selling more mortgages, you know, giving people houses who couldn't afford to have those houses because we're in boom time. You know, it's great. 
the money's going to be around forever. Everyone's going to be fine. We can lend people, you know, half a million pounds, knowing that they may not even be able to pay it back. But we can take that chance. We can gamble on it. Turned out that's a really bad thing to do over a long period of time. And the American economy collapsed, which led to the world economy collapsing, which led to, you know, some really hard times. Um, we've had, you know, until relatively recent times, Britain has been in recession, been tricky, been hard. There hasn't been much financial growth because, well, the money hasn't been worth so much. We got out of that partly, though, by printing lots of money and making sure that the interest rates were very low. Hmm. That means that, well, if we keep everything low, then people can start to earn more and uh, spend more. And that's the key. You know, money is only useful if people are using it. If people don't use it, if everyone holds on onto it to their chests because they're afraid of being poor, then, well, businesses can't thrive and the economy can't grow. So people need to spend the money. So, OK, we encourage the government encourages people to spend the money. It's great. But then, of course, COVID comes along. Oh, no. And it looks like that the 2020s might not be quite as uh, incredible as the booming 1920s. Now, the booming 20s, that ended right at the end, 1929, with the Great Depression, which is one of the nastiest depressions that we've seen. But, you know, there was one 100 years before it. There'll be another one afterwards. And so, you know, maybe we're going into the next depression where we'll look at our money and it just won't be as valuable as it was a few years ago. You know, we won't be able to buy as much food with it. You know, £10 then is not as good as £10 now. And we'll think back to the good old days when you could go to the shop and buy a whole meal for £10. But maybe, you know, by you know, within a few years, you'll need £20 to buy that same meal or something. So it's a dream that we're living. We all agree that this money stuff is going to have some kind of value, but that value definitely goes up and down. Um, and again, it's part of the system as it was created. Mm. So could we live a different dream, perhaps? This is where it gets strange and even more philosophical because with the advent of the internet and with the advent of blockchain technology, we now have the capacity for other people who are not governments and not established banking institutions to create their own currency. And it kind of, you know, philosophically, it's a very simple step, isn't it? We realize that we're all using money that is basically made up. It's an invention. It's a myth. Mm -hmm. So why should we just let the government make up the myth? Why don't individual people or groups of people make up their own stories, their own dreams, their own mythological currencies? And that's what we've seen happening over the last decade. The most famous one is this one, the Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin works through blockchain technology. It is uh, a thing that is given value through um, kind of, you know, they've, they've got the sort of rarity thing sorted out. There's only so much Bitcoin in the world and there will only ever be so much Bitcoin in the world. Um, you know, it's trickled out from computer systems that no one is in direct control of. Um, this Bitcoin drips into the world, like literally just appears on, on, on blockchain servers. And, uh, oh, wow, you got 150 pound in Bitcoin. Oh, and then it crashed. Oh, oh, it's all right. It might go back up again. That's the thing. It's a gamble. It's a it's a dream. Yeah. But the governments of the world, they hate Bitcoin and Ether and coin or whatever it's called and all the other kind of fiat uh, uh, cryptocurrencies, they call them nowadays. Uh, the governments don't like them because they have no control over them. The world banks don't like them because they have no control over them. Instead, it's kind of, you know, some people say it's democratizing money. Yeah. <clears throat> you had 200 and then it crashed. Oh, no. See, this is it. So there are two ways of sort of looking at the brave new world of money. Yeah. We either, you know, if everyone signed up to Bitcoin, then Bitcoin would become as valuable as any other kind of money. And in some ways it is because a lot of people already have signed up to it. You know, there are millions of people out there who own Bitcoin and trade in Bitcoin and buy things with Bitcoin. And as long as everyone agrees that that's how it should be, Bitcoin will be valuable. But what's to stop people just saying, nah, actually, I don't like Bitcoin anymore. I, I like this new kind of coin. I like Jake coin that they created. I like the humanity coin or, or whatever. Uh, what happens if the computers crash? Well, that's yeah, there is a fail safe there because blockchain technology isn't reliant on any one computer. The idea is that the, the value that the 
the existence using these words is hard the existence of bitcoin is actually happening simultaneously over many many servers across the world there are huge uh, bitcoin farms that have been set up or bitcoin mines where they just have banks and banks and banks of like really loads of computers and their job is to catch uh, because if, if you have the if you have the blockchain on your system you know, it's copied everywhere all over the world on everyone's systems you know, that's using this thing. But if you have it on your system, you get rewarded by being given a tiny bit of Bitcoin every you know, day or X amount of hours. Um, so the more servers you have that are running the, the blockchain, the more money you can gain. So that, that's why you know, in Eastern Europe or wherever, there are these huge warehouses which use a ton of electricity to keep running. But all they're doing is running the blockchain and taking in these tiny bits of Bitcoin all the time, which is making them incredibly wealthy. And then they can trade it and sell it and do whatever with it. But it is still a dream. You know, what if everyone decides, well, actually, no, Bitcoin, we don't think that does have value. We don't want to use that anymore. Then it will become obsolete. And everyone who's holding that incredibly valuable fiat currency will have nothing. You know, this cryptocurrency will just be nothing. It will just disappear because it is a dream. And sometimes people wake up from such things. Mm. So I don't know. Bitcoin could be the future. It could be that in 10 years, everyone's using Bitcoin and you know, we look back and we think, huh, the idea of a government in control of money, that's insane. We much prefer you know, having this democratized currency. Or it may be that we look back at Bitcoin and say, well, that was a weird sort of blip. And look at all those people that lost loads of money on that. Oh, they should have just kept to the, the standards. It might be that we go back to something that has a bit more intrinsic value. The one thing, you know, Bitcoin, the value of that goes up and down all the time. You know, sometimes it's incredibly valuable. Sometimes it's less so. It may disappear. It may get even more valuable. We don't know. It's kind of a gamble. Whereas gold, gold's sort of value stays relatively stable, and it has done for hundreds of years, you know, because gold is gold. You can touch it. You know, what if a war happens? Uh, and the banks all get closed or a pandemic happened and the banks collapse or the computers you know, go out because the power goes off. Well, with gold, you can just keep that under your bed, you know, in your sock drawer. You can have some gold and it's always going to have a value. So maybe gold is safer. But then, you know, it's not as exciting, is it? Yeah. Is there enough gold for all the people on the planet? Maybe not. Yeah, that's it. You know, it, but that um, I suppose is what make, it keeps its rarity and that therefore keeps its value. You know, Bitcoin has that built in. Once they've released, what was it, like 10 million Bitcoin or something, the, the computer algorithm will switch it off. There will be no more Bitcoin created. Um, and it'll be interesting what, what happens when that, when that occurs, because at the moment people are mining it. People are gathering it out of the ether as it's being created on this algorithmic sort of drip system. When that stops, when, there is, when the algorithm switches off, will everyone just say, wow, this stuff is even more valuable now because no more is being created? Or will people say, well, that game's over. You know, it now we don't like it anymore. We'll go on to a new currency. And that will be a really interesting thing to see. Um, you know, and it comes down to our collective consciousness. What will people accept? What will they not accept? What will they call money? What won't they? It's a wonderful sort of imaginative world that we live in <laughs> so there you are money guys but yeah philosophy currency that's what we need that's what we have i mean that's what it is it's just a wonderful idea isn't it the whole concept of money is a wonderful idea and it exists far more in our heads than it does out in the world and maybe that makes it you know one of the more philosophical things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis every time you go to the shop you know, that's philosophy you're engaging in on some level. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, guys. It was wonderful uh, rambling with you once again. Uh, next week or in two weeks time, we're going to get a bit dark because we're going to look at a philosopher who is, you know, arguably objectively not nice. Uh, but I don't know. We're going to look at a fascist philosopher before we go and look at the philosophy of fascism overall. So that, uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to tackle that one yet. But hey, we'll find out in two weeks, won't we? All right. Thanks, guys. And I'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks.